There's a saying in cricket that batsmen can set up games or save them, but it's the bowlers that win matches. A lot of skill and guile and a bit of luck is needed to take 20 wickets and win a test match. It can be a hard slog, especially on flat pitches with an old ball against batsmen who are set and in form. Bowlers need a solid game plan and not only do they need to be good enough to execute, they also need to adapt as the situation changes or when their plan is not working. We asked Jonathan Connor, a specialist in skills acquisition with Cricket Australia, to help explain some of the techniques and strategies bowlers use and why they make certain decisions. Right at the start of the game, the bowler's always looking to get into a bit of a rhythm to make sure that they're working efficiently. And from a research perspective, we don't know too much about what rhythm actually looks like, but often it's a kinesthetic feel that bowlers talk about. They feel like they're in rhythm. Uh, they feel like everything's working towards what they're trying to do. One way for a bowler to find their rhythm and gain confidence early is to bowl their stock ball. We often refer to a stock ball as a ball that bowlers are most confident in bowling. It's almost their, their natural and most practiced action. And it's something that whenever you perhaps feel a bit out of form or not quite bowling where, you, where you'd like to, you always refer back to that you know, stock delivery that you feel gives you the best opportunity to start to build up a bit more rhythm and a bit more pressure on the opposition. Bowling, especially fast bowling, is an unusual action, and a complex one. There are a lot of moving parts. Fast bowlers are not only trying to produce maximum velocity, but also need to pitch it in a particular area, while potentially trying to make the ball move. From a research perspective, we often talk about during performance not to think too much about um, the movement itself, but instead the movement effects. So what it is that you're actually trying to, to do. So pitch the ball on a good length, that's where your focus should be externally on the environment uh, as opposed to internally and on a specific movement. Given that the movement itself, bowling, is such a complex action and there are so many moving parts, if you focus internally on one, you might find that a lot of others start to break down. For a bowler, it's all about taking wickets. And one of the most effective ways to do this is to create confusion for the batsmen and make them hesitate. At the start of the game, what the bowler is probably trying to look to do is get the batsman to play off the front foot and execute some vertical bat shots. So often what the bowler might do is try and bowl what's called a good length delivery, where the batter is in two minds or indecisive about coming forward or stepping back. Visually what it looks like for the batter, given that every individual is different, is a ball that's about knee high to waist high. So for example, with a full length delivery, uh, what we often see is batters uh, execute a, a vertical bat shot off the front foot and it's quite stable, it's quite comfortable and it's quite efficient. Likewise, when a ball is pitched very short, uh, often we see batters step back to the ball uh, and play a horizontal bat shot. Uh, again, that's a, quite a stable, efficient position. Uh, however, when bowlers bowl what's considered a good length delivery, uh, which can be anywhere between you know, four to six metres from the batter, uh, it often becomes this region where it's not quite stable or not quite efficient to be on the front foot or the back foot. So the batter has a, has a choice to make as to whether they go forward or back. And this can often result in some executional errors and often result in uh, a dismissal. As we have seen with batting, being able to adapt is crucial in test cricket. Everything changes and changes quickly. The new ball is only new for so long. The pitch starts to change and you might also have batsmen who are growing in confidence to complicate matters even further. And not only that, like uh, where, where you want to pitch is obviously incredibly difficult, but uh, also you've got a batter who ultimately can adapt and, and move to you. So if you're bowling a particular uh, ball outside off, you can have a batter like Steve Smith who will walk two stumps across uh, and be able to play shots that you might not necessarily anticipate or expect a batter to play to you, which can uh, basically disrupt your game plan. Well, that's great driving in the ball. What bowlers are often trying to look to do is, is build up pressure for, for the batter. So while they may score singles and boundaries, often the, the bowler is looking for the batter to play high risk shots or look uncomfortable. Oh, and that's a good bouncer. Both batters and bowlers will walk into a game with their own sort of game plan or their idea of what they're trying to accomplish or, or how they're going to try and accomplish it. But naturally you always have to adapt to not only the conditions but also the opposition. So while a good length delivery might be your stock ball uh, that you feel helps you build pressure, the ball in which you're looking to take a wicket with perhaps might change. So instead of being a little bit fuller and outside off, uh, it might be back of a length and short, trying to get the batter to, to play a shot that he shouldn't play uh, or that's incredibly high risk. So in that sense, uh, bowlers will often have a game plan and they'll often adjust it slightly depending on the conditions and the opposition. In a team, there are many different types of bowlers. 
Captains will use different bowlers in spells throughout a game. The purpose and duration of each spell will be different based on the bowler, the batsman and the stage of the game. Similar to batting and rolls, bowlers have their own sort of roles. Bowlers might come in different spells, different periods of the game and, and have different game plans for that. So for example, the, the game plan during the first six to eight overs of the game is going to be very different to what it might be during the 50th or 60th over uh, when the ball and the conditions have changed. But ultimately, the bowlers might employ a particular game plan for a particular spell. That was a flipper. Often you'd start to expect spin to come into play as the ball starts to deteriorate and get a little bit older, as the pace bowlers start to get a little bit more fatigued. Uh, spin bowlers provide the opportunity to deceive the batsman in different ways. Often they bowl quite a bit slower, uh, however able to extract a large amount of lateral deviation off the pitch. So at international level off spinners often can impart over 2,000 revolutions per minute on the ball, uh, while our league spinners often uh, impart over 2,500 revs, which gives them greater opportunity to spin the ball. One of the most interesting and perplexing developments in bowling has nothing to do with optimal spell duration or perverse swing. It's actually the success of left arm bowlers. The fact that we, we have seen so many left arm bowlers come through in the, in the last sort of you know, 10 to 30 years. We sort of draw on some previous research that's looked at the uh, fighting hypothesis or the uh, negative frequency uh, effect where if you're an up and coming cricketer uh, and you face 75% of your deliveries against a right-handed bowler and only 25% against a left-handed bowler, all of a sudden, once you get to the high levels, that left-handed bowler has an advantage uh, simply because you haven't seen them, you haven't attuned to their kinematic cues and perhaps you don't anticipate um, their, their bowling action as well as you do against right-handers. So that's certainly been quite a big avenue of research uh, that we're also looking at is the, the natural advantage that left-arm batters and bowlers uh, have. Oh,